Okay, I'm sorry. Let's call this meeting to order. <laughs> um, so, additions or changes to the agenda? I have a couple. Does anybody else? Okay, I apologize. I hope this won't keep happening, but these things keep coming in after I have the agenda. So, one is the liquor licenses, which were in your packet. Um, and those are uh, six for the Maple Corner Community Store, which would be sale of liquor and tobacco, consumption of those items off pro premises, or at least the liquor parts, consumption on premises, and then uh, class two, which is beer and wine, and class one, which is spirits in the bar. And then there's one for Adamant Co-op, which is just sale of liquor and tobacco. So everybody understand that? No, I think they don't do tobacco. I think theirs is just a class okay. two liquor, beer and wine. Okay, I thought it said tobacco on the form, but um, I don't think it matters. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, any questions about that? Oh, sorry, that's, uh, this is a, a additions to the agenda. One other thing, um, t uh, after talking with Toby and with um, the, the staff in the office, we were thinking it would be easier for everybody if we changed Toby instead of $30 an hour, which would come out to about $16,000 a year, to just give him $16,000 a year. And he gets a bi-weekly paycheck, is no, that? No, monthly. Bi oh, he, he just wanted a monthly it paycheck. It would be 12 equal payments of $1,333.34, and that way he doesn't have to keep track of the hours. And, and we don't have to check them on him and, exactly. and all that sort of thing. So any? That makes a lot of sense. Everybody okay with yeah. that? Um, well, heck, let's vote on those two things then, since we're moving right along. Um, so uh, let's see. Let's move that the liquor license, that the license, liquor and tobacco licenses for the Maple Corner Community Store and the Adamant Co-op uh, be approved. Uh, so moved. Second. Second. More discussion. As the named applicant on the Maple Corner permits, I think I'll abstain from the vote. Okay. Does that make sense to yep. people? That would be appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And then the second one is, Barbara, you have a contract for Toby? Or did you, I take you, that? You took it. Oh, I do. So, um, <laughs> But I've told you what it would be. It would be an annual salary of 16,000 equal monthly installments of uh, about 1,300. Uh, anybody want to talk more about that? Okay, let's move that uh, we approve this contract and authorize me to sign it. Uh, so moved. Second. Okay, more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Remind me to sign that and give it to you. And uh, Jordan, when you finish signing those, yep. uh, just give me the barber if you would. Well done. Okay. Anybody here? We are moving right along. We're, we've now reached the public comment portion of our. Hi, John. No. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. We, uh, the next one is John McCullough. And he said he was going to come, but he thinks we're not getting to him for another three, uh, another few minutes. Um, two, but two more folks. Just that may be John and Donna. Uh, no, it's Colleen. Okay, but um, John has got. John says, "Let me see if I can do this." It, be, as zoning administrator, he needs a much more. Um, what I want to say, sophisticated mapping system than what he has is able to have on his current computer. And he's asking to set up a workstation in the town office, which would include um, a desktop, uh, some hardware and software. Uh, you can take a look at this if you want. Um, and that, um, there's another, that is a quote um, for a Dell setup, but the town office prefers that he get the, what's that, R, R tech? R, R B tech. R B yep. tech, because a lot, it would cost probably a little more, maybe a little more than 2,000. Um, 
and with it comes a warranty that they will fix it and that they'll um, make it all work with our system and all that sort of thing. So this, the, am I missing anything, Barbara? It, it, um, if we get this workstation, it all needs to be wired into and connected through our server and so forth. And we just really strongly feel that it's more appropriate to have RB Tech be responsible for all of that. Plus, if any issues down the road, RB Tech will be responsible for it as opposed to a separately purchased something that we went off and bought on our own and then hoped would work. If there are any problems down the road, RB Tech will be responsible. Um, and we, RB Tech gave us a quote uh, about a month ago, I guess. No, it was actually se uh, several months ago. Several months ago. And it was just under, but this is what I recall. I sent it to you guys a number, a couple, a month or more ago. Mm -hmm. It was a, seems like it was 1900 and something. It seems like it was just under $2,000. So only about $100 more than what John has there. Um, what I don't know is if that quote has already expired. And if the cost would might go any higher, Tegan tried to get a, 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 a response on that, and she did not hear by the end of the day today. We hopefully we could have an answer for you tomorrow. Well, I would like to suggest that we move um, that John can spend uh, the I guess John can spend up to two thousand two hundred dollars for a, a workstation and let them work out which one. Thoughts on that? Yeah. I would just put in, I, I know that when we first talked about this, the question arose of if it would work for him to use the Lister computer, and I've, after talking to him, it's clear that it wouldn't, both timing-wise and hardware-wise. Yeah, and this computer would live at the town office? Yeah. So in theory, were he to retire or choose to leave, it could be used by the next person? Oh, yes, right. it would not okay. belong to him. It would belong to the town. And that's one of the goals, I think, is having him be able to work at the town office and transition eventually <laughs> to somebody else. And at some point soon, we've got to consider, um, a, an oh, Jan Olson has agreed to be assistant zoning administrator. So um, that will give them both a computer that they can share. We're not going to appoint Jan tonight, but soon we probably will do that. Um, yeah, I, I think, um, well, so one of the things that's on here is the uh, assumed software uh, for Microsoft Office for $200, which I think is probably just over or just under whatever the, the annual cost is, but that would be, so um, a zoning admin is one of the accounts that would be added to the email system that we're talking about um, and would include that. So I, I wonder if, like, I've, I've worked with RV in another capacity where, you know, they're fairly agnostic about where the material comes from. There's a, a little extra bit about whether or not it's covered under like a warranty and whether it's coming through them or not. I would just say it's probably worth just either having them freshen their quote relative to the specs that John has listed. Um, and just, I'd be happy to help facilitate that, I guess, since I've already kind of got a dialogue going with them. and. You know, wh whoever's is the most efficient, and as long as John is happy with whatever alternative they offer, um, then I, I don't, I don't think the price point is really the objection here. It's just a matter of where where it comes from. So, um, and it'd be worth having them just freshen up their quote and give any last. The actual bringing it online and, and isn't isn't hard for them. It's not a bunch of extra work, regardless of where the machine comes from. Um, generally speaking, so. <clears throat> so you suggest we not vote on it tonight? Uh, I, I think your uh, recommendation of, of approving either entity to procure something for this purpose, not to exceed $2,300, I think, to be safe, uh, would, would be fine. And if we can find a way to come underneath that, uh, by a few hundred dollars, uh, it sounds like we should be able to. Um, then, then either either party can move forward with an acquisition. Okay. Would you like to put that in the form of a motion? Uh, no. Sure. Um, 
uh, I would move that uh, that we authorize either RB Technologies or John McCullough to uh, purchase a uh, dedicated computer to reside at the town office um, for the purpose of conducting uh, work relative to the zoning administrator, mm -hmm. um, not to exceed $2,300. And that that should either go through John McCullough for reimbursement uh, or um, okay. RB Technology or I guess we could buy, we would, the town would buy it directly, right? You know, on, on the town credit cards. Yeah, I think you would probably do the purchase, yeah. wouldn't you, Barbara? Yeah. 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 Okay. I'll second that. All right, discussion? Uh, I would just um, add, in addition to the computer, there's some accessories there, too. So he, he needs to purchase an entire workstation. Is that how you would say it? Uh, an entire workstation, yeah. You got that in? Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody understand what we're doing? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, and the motion passes. And we're all ready to Curtis Pond. Can yes? I have a question? Uh -huh. Just to make sure I understood that at this point, Tegan mm -hmm. can back out of communicating with RB Tech and that Jordan, you volunteer to coordinate with John and or RB Tech, whichever direction you guys decide to go. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Um, so we're actually already to Curtis Pond, but we're awfully early, and your folks aren't all here yet, I presume. Oh, well, uh, let me just do one more thing. This is not on the agenda, but there's no action needed. We've received our annual equalization study. Um, do you guys know what that is? Equalization of property taxes? Uh, not specifically. Yeah, yeah okay. So um, every year we have to pay the state a percentage of our property taxes for uh, schools. Yeah. Um, and the state, in order to make sure that we're not way undervaluing our property, for example, and sending them what they would consider less than our share, they come in and they do, not an appraisal, but I think what they do is they look at properties that have sold and compare them to how the listers have listed them. And then they give us a common level of appraisal by which we have to, um, we have to uh, change the percentage of our property taxes for purposes of calculating what the statewide tax is. And not too surprisingly, this year we're way under in the way we're listing them because, of course, prices have been shooting up. So our common level of, of appraisal this year is 80%. So we will be multiplying our grand list by 20% in order to figure out our property tax share. But pretty much every town in the state is probably in the same boat, so it probably comes out about the same anyway. So that's just a for your information. Does anybody want to see this or ask any questions about that? Okay. Okay? Good. Curtis Pondam, are you ready so, to go? Yes, Barbara. So, so I'm going to excuse myself. If I could get all the paperwork you saw, I signed so I can take it back to the town office. Thank you very, very much. Hold this as a reminder. To, to, just that, to that's, your, that's your copy, unless it's Ann's copy. He can have it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Great. I'm going to, um, I brought, uh, we, I've been keeping a status of where we are on the, and I updated today. and. Uh, um, you wanted to hand out. Um, this is terrific to have this thing. I, I, well, see, this. I can keep it, remember. I don't want to remember anything. So it's on the <laughs> That's the purpose of it, to avoid. <clears throat> I didn't get an extra one on it for me to follow along. Um, do you I have some, somebody I have to, access to it. So if somebody wants to share, share, it would be helpful. Thanks, Kelly. And so, um, I think uh, we don't. I, I want to kind of jump ahead to ask a question about something else because Mark, or about the, the dam, but Mark said he was going to be here at 6 15. I was wondering if Jamie, if you had um, the last meeting, I gave a letter of support from, to be signed by the 
select board for a, a grant through the Rural Economic Development Initiative. Did you guys do anything about that? That doesn't sound familiar to me, Marge. Oh, I sent I you the... I remember yeah. seeing it, but I don't think it made it to a meeting. No, I, I remember you bringing it up, Marge, uh, and uh, to be sent to uh, Jamie. But Which I did. Yeah, yeah, and so I don't think that that was uh, circulated. Okay, I, that, that was just to give Mark Yeah. It's, what I'm going to have to do for each, anytime we have a grant, um, we'll, we'll probably need a letter of support from the town. And I can't remember who it was last meeting said wanted to know what the requirements were for reporting and all that. And so I, I am asking that question every, from each one. And I haven't gotten a response back yet from the Rural Economic Development Initiative yet. And I think um, it, would, it would, to kind of streamline that a little bit, Marge, I think as we kind of formalize the partnership, it would be worth also formalizing how how that works so that you know we're we're generating the letter of support and then there's our and that was certainly a concern the last time was you know who's going to be responsible for right. administering yeah. and I think or matching and, and yeah. how this, that all works out. Yeah. Well. And so I, can, and I just want to bring it yeah, up. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, this is for a very small grant yep. under seventy five hundred. But if we ever if we do get something large then Definitely, but if you want, I'll go, I'll nag the person to see if they can give me what the process will be for administering the, and then um, I'll send that to you, okay. Jamie, and then at the next meeting, if you guys can. Uh, and that letter is in the Curtis Pond folder for today's oh, okay. meeting. Okay. Okay. So, are you suggesting that be part of the MOU that we rewrite the MOU to? Um, Formalize how we would work on that, or uh, yes. Yeah. So I guess uh, <laughs> I had a conversation today, which I guess I can speak to since it's related to the Curtis uh, Dam. So I uh, reached out to uh, the town attorney um, and uh, had a pretty productive conversation about uh, next steps and. Um, and one of the recommendations uh, is to you know, formalize the MOU um, into an agreement that kind of hashes out who's responsible for what and what happens in what order. Um, and so uh, they are going to be uh, taking a, a, a stab at a first draft and trying to get us that. Is, it, is that Bob Fletcher? Is it Bob um, and uh, Joe? Joe. Yeah, uh, so I had a conversation with the two of them today uh, over the phone. Did they say anything about the fact that the MOU was signed by the last board um, and you're now an all new board? Uh, no. No, the, I think the idea based on kind of what we discussed was, you know, pay, picking up the, honoring the MOU. There's no, uh, uh, specific conversation about change, changing those conditions, but like adding certain conditions um, that really formalize uh, a number of the issues and concerns that have, have been addressed like, or brought up since the signing of that and the bond vote and everything else, just try to bring everything into one document that is more than just an MOU and officially uh, designates the statuses of, of the parties involved. Um, and then part part of that conversation is also, uh, or, or doing that is to bring both groups under just kind of one roof so that we can have much more collaborative, transparent conversations. So um, that's, that's kind of where we stand. Point of clarification, who pays for that? Is that coming out of our funds? Yeah. I mean, it's our funds. It isn't right. coming out of the whole one thing now. Well, right. No, but I mean, specifically, <clears throat> does it come out of the dam project funds that we're raising? What is, what is it? Is well, they're, they're having the attorneys, yes. uh, both Joe and Bob, 
do more work on the MOU. I'm just curious. I mean, if it, it has to be done. I'm just, are we? Is that town? Is that the town? Yeah. Well, it seems to me they're company. representing us in this case, yeah. so I think yeah, we pick that one up. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What were you concerned about um, when you said, or what did they say about the old select board having signed it? Are you concerned it must be redone? No, I just was curious whether they thought your five people that didn't sign that the the no one sitting signed it. So uh, what kind of legality is that? Okay. I think it's doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. You were, you're free to disavow it, but yeah. Uh, the, the the conversation today was uh, was was intended to be a very candid one. Uh, you know, we we as a group have in the last in the last meeting, I believe, mm -hmm. um, uh, kind of made a, a a statement affirming the last MOU and a desire to collaborate and move things forward. Um, to, to the best of our ability, and so that was part of the conversation. It's just like we we all have an interest in doing, you know, quite literally. How do we have much better conversations um, and much more efficient conversations, and you know what what need to be put in place to kind of facilitate those conversations? And and it was good. It was a good productive yeah. conversation. So um, we <laughs> we can only move as fast as we move in the, on on these things, but. Uh, within a couple of weeks, they're hoping to get us a, a draft of uh, of that agreement and, uh, and a punch list that we can that we can kind of consider. So, did you talk about the other agreements that we need to? Not yes. the other agreements, but the those, quick claim those deeds. Are, yeah, those are those are all part of it. And to to the best of my understanding, to date, um, there there's there's a will a willingness to help find find a way forward. You know, there, there's not a, a strong objection to those. Okay. And some some of those conversations, I think, are going to have to be had in an executive session because they're going to re, uh, uh, involve negotiations with other parties, even outside of these two parties. So, and, and making sure that um, yeah. that certain risks and liabilities are are covered, but um, but there is there is not a strong strong resistance to, to finding something, or finding a way forward, um, that align with everything that's been discussed so far, certainly with this group. Um, that's about as much as I can share with that conversation um, uh, for, for now, I guess. Um, Curtis Pond Dam Association, how do you want to proceed? I had listed three, four items that I was hoping we would cover. We can go through, I mean, we talked about the MOU in the first one. Uh, yes, that one's done. Plus, you want to walk us through the timeline. Well, so, why I, I do you guys. For pur purposes in our discussion. So, I'm thinking we should go with the agenda items. Fine. And then we can come back to this if we, if, you know, provide information. And being careful to leave enough time, I think we all want to go into executive session together to talk about the RFP. Okay. Okay. So I think the second thing options for Including, liability. excuse me, are you Mr. Tucker? Oh, I, I thought you must be. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, yes. um, yeah, go ahead, introduce us, Marge. I was going to say, this is Jeff Tucker, who's the engineer on the um, Du Bois and King contract. And he's come out to help <laughs> give in, in background information on, on different liability insurances that he's seen in the past, as well as to kind of talk about the legal actions so that or the legal documents. This is a good time. Jeff said that he would come out tonight, and I really appreciate it. But if we can pull out as much as we need yeah, to, so perfect. he doesn't have to come back again yeah. <laughs> soon. <laughs> All right. So I don't know if you guys want to ask questions of Jeff. Or did, what the, did he want to meet the new board? Or? Um, and the, oh, this, what, do you want to introduce Ann? Yeah. As, or Jamie, why don't you do it, Jamie? <laughs> I'm Jamie. I'm sure we've met. I'm sure. Um, I'm part of the. Yes. You have two Anns. Oh, sorry. Go you have two Anns here. I'm Ann Winchester, and this is Ann Tulin, who we call Ann Tulin. <laughs> uh, and I'm Jordan Keys. Uh, let me just interrupt because John just came in. John, we already did yours. Pardon me. We already did yours. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
We already did yours. Oh. We, yeah. we okay. authorized the money and Jordan will be in touch. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I drove over here. Before the John runs out, I'd like to introduce him to Jeff because John's the zoning administrator and we have, and, and Jeff has submitted the permit application for the Callus zoning. So just, so I don't know if you guys know each other already. But Jeff Thanks, Tucker, John, John McCullough. Okay. So we're on the Curtis Pond now. Okay, um, I'm going to stick around for a bit. Okay, sure. Okay, why don't you guys then go ahead? Well, do you um, want, I don't know if I, you haven't prepared anything. Who wants to? Liability well, coverage, did you, I mean, I think, as you, you know about the passive insurance. I'm not sure we all do. Would passive you? will it pass it when the dam is constructed and meets state standards? Passive will, Passive is the entity that's associated with the League of Cities and Towns that insures the town. Passive has special insurance for dams to the tune of one million. They have many dams that they insure that way. Fred Satink is the head of the part of the, he's, he's not the head, I guess, head of, he's one of the top people in the passive bureaucracy. Fred has been here, worked with, a, worked with us, worked with you. The last time I was here, Fred spoke about the possibility of supplemental insurance, but I have not talked to him. So I, I spoke to him today. Um, the last select board had um, asked him to look into whether or not there was supplemental what they offer for all of the I think 63 or so municipal or utility owned dams that they insure they offer one million dollars in downstream liability um, and that is specifically downstream liability and not coverage for the dam itself it doesn't cover the replacement insurance. cost yeah, it's not property right yeah. um, and so the last select board asked him to look into if there was insurance for replacement cost, if there was insurance during construction phase, and if there was the ability to raise the million dollar downstream liability to a higher policy. So I spoke to him today to find out if he'd made progress. And he said that more or less the answers to all the questions are probably not. Um, he said all of the dams they insure have the same million dollar downstream liability. Um, he, he doesn't know of others that have, um, you know, balked at that and, and found additional coverage. Um, he did say they're still talking with the, his, maybe you know more, he called it reinsurance, reinsurer. Yeah, reinsurer. Mm -hmm. So um, they're still talking with that other insurer to see if there's uh, an additional liability policy um, to get above the million, but he wasn't super optimistic about it. Um, and he, he felt that, you know, the other municipalities he works with have not really questioned that policy substantially. Um, he also said that typically the coverage during construction is borne by the contractor. And I know that the con one of the, the contractor we've been talking to the most over the last year or two um has is it two million i spoke i spoke with them saturday about this very yeah. thing uh and it's it's uh one million is typical and two million during the construction i think it costs a little more but there is no i mean i worded it like an act of god that takes it down he said well we're not touching the dam so you're in the exact same boat as if as we are right this second. Right. And uh, like he used the example, he's done all the local dams uh, fair, uh, at Fairley, um, which is four times the body of water. 
and a town, a real town, right there, the damage would be, you know, a factors of 10 more, and they just all find it acceptable. It's just sort of, sort of standard dictated by the state. And so all this, that's, so basically, no, there's no act of God coverage that he could pay more for, and he gets covered for more, so. Uh, but he, I, I liked his point, his stress was, well, that's the same as today, if it goes today. Maybe Jeff might be able to speak to some of that, too. Not really, uh, Marge. I think what Colleen just articulated is, is consistent with my experience as well. Will it be possible um, during construction to ask the, what would you say, the person who's building it, the construction person, to uh, increase their liability to cover us? Yeah, and they can. And it's, you know, X dollars per million. Uh, I don't, he said he's never been asked to be increased to more than two, ever. Uh, yeah, or that any else that he knows of. All right. And that will cost us more, is that right? That will increase yes. our yes. cost. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. come out of the, I mean, it's a cost of the budget of the project. Right? Yeah. yeah. So we could put that into the RFP. Yes, we yeah. can put. We can make that a condition of the RFP. Yeah. Oh, yeah. and it will cost more. And but keeping in mind that 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 what they describe is what's typical. We, you know, we'd be going. Anything more than we'd like to advocate for the what all the other towns have done. I think if you put in the RFP, you'd want to make it an option. You know, what if the town wants extra coverage? What would you charge for it? So they don't just build it into the bid. No, but, right. but wait, there's two pieces. There's after construction. Then we have the one million liability, and right. then there's during construction. Yeah, they're only covering during, and you can put in the RFP just like you said. But I want to understand what Colleen just said. You're saying one million would be typical for a during construction policy as yes. well? Yes. Yeah. But then we would, would we have the liability on top of that that we get from passive? No, because... No, it doesn't even minutes. start till it's completely yeah. done. Right. Passive doesn't start till it's completely <laughs> finished, sealed by the state that it's a okay. hundred year dam well, what or you, whatever. What you said was that one million is for downstream damages. What about... <coughs> The dam just washed out, and we have to start again. Why wouldn't we want to we have more for that? that the, well, one the, million's not going to cover both. Wait, wait, mm -hmm. slow down for a minute. There are three different kinds of insurance we're talking about here. Okay. One is when the dam is built and done. Passive will insure you for downstream liability for a million dollars, not until. Okay. So the town, of course, shouldn't accept. The Arabico offers a dedication and own the dam until passive can insure. Okay. The second type of insurance is insurance that the contractor carries for liability for their negligence. It's for their negligence that occurs during construction. That's completely separate. And that's a standard is a million dollars. So if the coffer dam breaks, or something weird happens. It's hard to imagine. It's a pretty simple project as dams go, but something bad happens. They have a million dollars that, if it's you know, would cover downstream liability, and I think probably the dam itself, probably everything that flows from the from the negligence, but that's just during construction. So, if you want, you can ask, as in the RFP, we can ask for optional additional coverage and, you know, a separate price for that. And then, if, when we negotiate the contract with them, we negotiate the contract with them, we would decide, you know, do we want to pay? If it's cheap, maybe we do. It's expensive, maybe. So, so let me understand though, we're the, if the dam washes out during construction for some reason, then we've got to go back and spend another 700000 or whatever it's going to cost, plus we'll have the downstream liability. So I'm having trouble with why we wouldn't want $1,700,000 uh, $1, of million. coverage. Well, then we could probably, we could ask for it. But I, I you can decide that then. You can decide it when we yeah. negotiate the contract. Of course, but I'm yeah. trying to understand. Go ahead, Joey. Uh, I think it's also worth understanding uh, 
what that insurance uh, covers. To Mark's point, you know, if the coffer dam fails as the result of poor construction or something like that, but if there is like a significant storm event, you know, that would be an act of God, and then and then who owns the liability of of act of God type uh, situations that wouldn't necessarily be covered by either of these uh, uh, insurances. And so there's a certain amount of calculus that needs to be put into that or a decision around what mechanism is going to sufficiently mitigate that, that risk. Um, and uh, my understanding is that's the, that's the bigger question, it isn't so much you know, what, whether the insurance is adequate for the construction phase, whether the insurance is adequate for the post-construction phase, and uh, because there's, there's already mechanisms for each of the bodies that are, that are willing to insure those. It's the, what about, you know, what is the, what is the actual risk, and can we put some calculus around what the downstream risk is for yes. an act of God type um, failure uh, sure. that wouldn't be covered by these things. So sure. I can talk a little bit about yeah. that if you want. Sure, sure. <clears throat> okay. So we're talking about a situation now where there's a huge rainstorm or a you know a hurricane and a dam's overtopped and collapses, right? And it really doesn't matter very much whether that happens now, during construction, or after, excuse me, later, okay? It's pretty much the same. So what is the calculus there, the risk calculus? One of the things that you need to, anyone who's good at risk analysis does, is you have to weigh different risks. So one option is we go ahead and we issue the bonds, we start construction. This town still doesn't own the dam, but it's issued the bonds. And the dam collapses and there's downstream damage. Let's say the damages are three million dollars. I'm just picking a number, okay? You know, the store, it's gone. Nine houses, maybe really badly damaged. Attorney's fees, <laughs> you know, you name it. I mean, I'm just, I'm trying, a, I, I'm deliberately trying a worst case here. So that's $3 million. So let's say option one is the town is connected with this enough and the town is sued and um, nobody's insurance covers it, and there's a $3 million liability. What would the town do? Well, I think the only thing the town could do is issue bonds. In other words, you, you'd have to borrow that money. You don't have $3 million lying around. So you'd borrow the money, and probably would cost you, <coughs> I'm gonna pick a number out of my ear, $200,000 a year to pay off those bonds. Okay. But you can't stop there. That's only half the analysis. The other half is, what if you don't do anything? What if you say, we're so worried about liability, we're just not gonna do this. We won't issue the bonds. And the same thing happens. Okay? The same three million dollars. It's arguable that the town, I mean, I, I know you've probably heard, well, then the town wouldn't be connected with it, wouldn't have any liability. I have to tell you, in my professional opinion, I don't think it's black and white like that. Because the town is so engaged already that the town would be sued. But let's say that the town had no liability. So the only people who had liability are the current owners who don't have any money anyway, and so that would just, end. But the town would probably lose, we think, very conservatively, $20 million in assessed value. And that would probably cost the town something like $200,000 a year. 
So it's really $200,000 and $200,000. You cannot, when you're analyzing risk, you can't just say, oh, let's be conservative and look at this risk. You have to look at both doing something and doing nothing. The difference, though, is that when anybody who's a good risk analyst looks at comparative risk, they multiply the dollar risk by the chance of it occurring. So on this side, the side of the dam collapsing because of a weather event during construction and the town being on the hook, what is the chance of that happening? Well, of course, who the hell knows, but I would say personally, way north of one in 500. But let's just say it's one in 100. Let's be really conservative and say there's literally a 1% chance that that would occur. What is the chance that the town will lose $200,000 lose $200, a year in tax revenue? 100%. That's what would happen if you do nothing. The dam will eventually collapse, and the pond will be gone, etc. So you have $200,000 if you do nothing, and $20,000 or $2,000 a year if you do it, if you do involve yourself. In other words, the final, and you can fool with the numbers. See, these are just off the back of the envelope. You can fool with those possibilities all you want. You'll never get to the point where the financial risks to the town going ahead are greater than the financial risks of the town doing nothing. It's simply impossible. And what I suspect is you've only heard about that story from your lawyer, and it's just dead wrong. So I think from a liability perspective, so then you might ask, well, that's fine, Mark, but how do we attenuate the, li <laughs> how do we attenuate the possibility of a hurricane coming in the, you know, any time? The answer is, we try to do it this year if we can. I mean, that's the, I can tell you, we can tell you a little bit about timetable, and there's an argument that we might not be able to finish it this year. If we can't find a contractor, we'll do the work. But the best solution to liability from acting to God is to do nothing. I mean, it's to do, to act quick, as quickly as we can. Mark, I'm going to do take on a, a little bit of, of, of risk and, and probably say this, but <clears throat> I want to kind of correct the characterization. Certainly based on my conversation today, uh, the, the brunt of the conversation was, was not how do we put the town in the position of assuming the most minuscule amount of risk relative to that. Yeah. And so um, there, there is a, I, I don't, I don't think, <laughs> Uh, we'll be, we'll probably see eye to eye on a number of other issues, but uh, but but that one is not the main driver, and so let's let's not get too hung up on that particular thing. Uh, there there are other boxes that 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 the town attorneys would like to see checked. Um, uh, that have less to do with what happens if a catastrophic flood arrives. Um, everybody kind of knows that we'll go around in circles trying to figure out what, what zero risk looks like or, or how to achieve that um, for all the reasons that you've listed there. And so, so I think we can kind of move, move beyond that particular issue. Well, maybe what we ought to do, because it's important in terms of knowing, knowing how to move ahead, is to look at the timeline. Yeah. Um, the timeline, if we want to move this year, is driven by one date. May 15th. May 15th is the lead. Sometime in July, the bond bank will issue bonds for all towns that want to participate in have projects that were approved at town meeting and one and one a bond bill. I think that's late July they issue the bonds. So let's say they'll issue like $90 million worth of bonds. 
the last date to apply to be part of that bond issue is May 15th. And the town, so what the town would do is the town would file an application through its bond council to um, participate in the bond issue in the amount of X. And I think by the end of May, that application probably would be approved. I mean, if it's going to be approved. It's a very pretty quick timetable. So by the end of May, we would, that, at that point, when we've applied and they've approved it, it's pretty certain. So at that point, at the end of May, it would be pretty easy for the town to be in a position to negotiate a contract with a builder at that point. Because you remember, you don't want to issue a contract. You don't want to enter into a contract with a builder unless you have a pretty good idea you're going to have the money. So, the, um, but if you work back, part of that application, I think, is an opinion from bond council. And that opinion from bond council has to say that, the, you know, that it's legit and legal and that there's nothing wrong with it and that the town approved it, the town voters approved it, etc. It's an opinion letter from them. Um, the, and then when the bonds issue, the town does not issue the bonds. The bond bank issues the bonds. The reason that works for everybody is because the state of Vermont has a very good bond rating, double A. So the bonds are less expensive. So let's say they issue $450,000 worth of bonds for the town. Then what they do is they have the money. They have the $450,000. They turn around and loan it to the town. And the town promises to pay the loan back. So we don't actually issue the bonds, somebody else does, and we just pay off the loan via the assessments, you know, our taxes. And that's, that's how the process works. It does mean that it would be good if the RFP, you know, May 15th ain't so far off. It would be good if the RFP went out as soon as we can reasonably get it out so that we have some bids and we have an idea how many, how many bonds, you know, what the quantity of bonds we want to issue, I think. In other words, let's say the bids come in at $800,000. Well, we're going to have to raise a lot more money and we're going to have to issue the whole 450. If the, if the bids come in at 700000 maybe we don't have to issue all 450 or tell them all 450 And I don't know how the mechanics of that work. I just have a feeling that the sooner we get that RFP out the door, the better and the more likely that we are going to get bond council to, excuse me, the more likely we are to get contractor, if there is a contractor who will do the work this year to to, to come in and, and say they'll do it. Okay. Questions for Mark on that issue? Moving quickly to get an RFP out is, is one of the primary concerns at this point. You know, so, um, because, and, and, and I'm glad we have the engineer here to kind of talk through some of this, but what, this group particularly hasn't been privy to uh, our, we have the applications that are submitted, seven I believe, right? Six. Um, six. six. Um, and Margie had mentioned that there's been kind of dialogue, points of clarification, that sort of thing that have come in from, from those agencies, um, you know, rel relative to the design and engineering and kind of getting a better sense of where we stand um, on, on those and whether or not there's going to be like meaningful change orders that are going to come come as a result of some of that uh, dialogue yeah, and can, yeah. yeah and so it'd be good to just kind of get up to speed as possible on what the status of those 
applications are because it seems pretty hard. And in an ideal scenario, you would have permits in hand before you're engaging in quoting for something that could substantially change in price relative to changes in design or requests from from any of these agencies, even if it were just the engineering fees relative to those changes. Um, you know, that that moves the needle on on what the costs of the project are and um, and getting an, an updated, refreshed look at what the actual costs, you know, from the perspective of the engineering firm and um, are, are you project managers, I think? I, I, I'm not sure what the, what the official term would be for Dubois' care. <laughs> no, I know, I just, I, I don't want to mince words about what the actual uh, relationship is, I guess, right? So, sure, so if, if I may? Yeah. Yeah, of course. I, I think I, if, first, I just wanted to circle back to insurance. Yeah. Um, we have drafted what we refer to front-end bidding documents. Yeah. That if, if uh, and I've, I trust the town will be providing them to your attorney, if you haven't already, you know, for a review. And within those, within our general conditions, Article 6, there's a lot of contractor-required insurances, general, comprehensive, builder's risk, which goes to flooding and things like that. And certainly, and obviously, your, your council will be looking at those and seeing are those limits where you want them to be, as I earlier discussion or if you'd like to increase them with a rider or something like that. I just want to make sure that this board was aware of that and that your attorneys either have it or will be. Uh, secondly, uh, for what it's worth, I certainly would, you know, um, uh, if, if the attorneys have any technical questions, I'm certainly available and open to conversations and phone calls and things like that. So feel free to, you know, send my contact information to, to your attorneys, yeah. if that would be helpful for the community. Um, you know, in terms of permitting and, and, and bidding the project with a request for proposal, our fees, you're spot on, absolutely. Uh, the re lowest risk, if you will, um, for change orders and things like that is everything's in place and everything is set. Um, the permit still to be uh, acquired for this project, Vermont Dam Safety Permit, and there is on the second page. There's a whole page, list in there. Yes, yes. the list of the six. Yeah. We do feel as of today, you know, the, the the issues have largely been identified and resolved. Dam safety's already issued their review comments. I've largely addressed them. We're buttoning up a few things this week, you know. So is there still risk that something may change? Yes, it's pretty minimal at this point, but it's it's greater than zero. You know, they may find something else. They they may in the state of Vermont. Dam safety are the threatened and endangered. Rare, rare and taking folk are meeting later this month. You know, we don't anticipate anything. We've worked all of that through, but until they do, until conversations, it's the risk is greater than zero that something will change. So you're absolutely correct. Um, I think it's reasonably low risk. You know, but we're not the ones issuing the permit. So you know, you've uh, you've been in conversations yeah. with Dam safety, right? Oh yes, yeah, yeah, and and as of last week, so. So we're pretty clear on what they want, but until you know that finalizes. Um, so that's where we stand on, on, on the permits, and, and as Marge said, the, the, the list of them that are in there. But we don't even have one yet. Right? That's correct. Yeah, so we don't and have even one. You know, say. in your conversations, do you have any ideas to time? Well, I'd have to have the ish. yes, it's a short answer mark to the question. Um, the longer one is when, when, when we circle back with dam safety, they're going to need about six weeks or so to issue. Um, they did a very comprehensive review. It should be an administrative function. So Wetlands is said that we don't need a permit from them. The, the rare and endangered, as I said, their committee meets later this month. I'm not quite sure. But there's a difference between them telling us that they don't see anything in yes getting the approval. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there is, like um, Jeff said, there is a risk they could come back, but the fact that there's been so much back and forth, I think a lot of these, uh, Jeff feels pretty secure that he's gotten pretty much all, most of the comments back. So that's a risk we have to decide if we want to issue the... Uh, what about the historic preservation or the historic... Um, that's, that's a total unknown. Yeah, that one is underway. And well, it's an, yeah, but it's an unknown. That's correct. Like, I yeah. mean, they can't even <laughs> uh, drill 
till end of May. Well, I did ask. Um, I, I did get at the end of the day today. Um, Catherine Quinn said, "Can they come out? They want. They were curious what the what it was like at the dam. That could they come out? So I was going to go down tomorrow and see how much snow is there and how you know if they can come out and do a site visit. So I just got that like." Um, a couple minutes before I came down. But also, not to sound terribly negative, but when you say it needs six more weeks, but basically dam safety said it would take three to six months, and that was in July. So I don't know that I believe six weeks either. Yeah. Uh, they, you know, Ben was pretty firm that six months was there, the outside. There are different time. kinds of risks here. One is the risk you're alluding to, which is could there be a change in design which would change that? And I think there it's dam safety. So I think the fact that dam safety is telling an engineer that they worked with again and again and again, look, we're basically okay with this, attenuates that. But I do think that we would want to build into the project budget a contingency to deal with inevitability of something. I mean, it's a pretty simple project compared to the store, for example, but it's still, I think, things change. Things change, and so we would want to build in a contingency. And, and that could even happen after approval. Something, as Jeff has said before, something could come up that they and I, weren't aware of, and that might change things. I also think that you could enter into a contract with a builder take a builder and enter into it, it's contingent upon receiving the permits. So that you're not in a situation where you have to pay. But I'm not sure of that, and I think that's one of the things that we would want to, I, we talked about it a little, but we're unsure of the, you know, with that. Well, in my limited experience with that, I, that largely comes down to whatever the risk of the build, whatever the appetite is for the, the builder. for the builder to assume that kind of risk, <clears throat> and you know, and these are. Well, this might be a, like a, a simple dam project. Dam projects aren't simple projects, so uh, so you know that's that's their own uh, that's their own calculus, and and do we narrow the pool um, by not having those things uh, by making that a condition of the of the RFP? It doesn't um, have to be a condition of the but, RFP. It could be in the contract. Or, or right, I'm sorry, a condition of the of the contract. Well, I yeah. think that that's the kind of thing where. <clears throat> You'd have to see, we'd all have to see where we are. Yeah. In other words, if all the permit people are saying it's done, it's just we're just doing the paperwork, that's one thing. If we're on the other hand and full of uncertainty, it's another. Um, can we circle back on the historic? Because Marge, you had mentioned that that, that, that might be a, a situation where there could be significant changes to either what they'd like to see done to the existing one or characteristics I, of the new one. Um, I'd like to Jeff to speak to that too. Sure. Um, the historical mm -hmm. society has to, or preserve, what is historical preservation has to say that it's being done in a historical way. And mm -hmm. they did talk about there are opportunities for mitigation between like dam safety, you know, they, they, want, them, they want the dam to, to be safe. Sure. And so there can be discussions, and um, obviously, the sooner the, they weigh in to the Army Corps of Engineers, the quicker we can come to a decision. And I don't, you spoke more on the technical end, and I was, as far as that whole, you know, the back and forth and stuff. So if you want to. Sure. Um, it all comes down to the Army Corps of Engineers permit. Yeah. There's a condition within that permit that says, uh, is there an adverse impact to the historical resource? Yes or no? And that decision has to be con con concurred upon by SHPO, the State Historic Preservation Office. And so uh, Curtis Pond Association has retained a archaeology historian, Catherine Quinn, and they're going to be out doing their work here imminently. And they're the ones who's going to be concluding and making a recommendation to SHPO on whether or not the project as proposed would have an adverse impact or not. 
If it has an adverse impact, then there's mitigation that would need to be completed. Uh, if there's not adverse impact or no adverse impact, um, then that's going to largely satisfy the enemy corps criterion, and then that permit by default will be issued because it's already issued the country at large. So we had a very uh, detailed conversation with, with both the SHPO people on the phone, with, with the archaeologist consultant, Catherine Quinn, um, uh, Curtis Pondfolk, uh, four or five weeks ago, three weeks ago, something like that. So they're doing their thing, and I think the, the general uh, you know, assessment is everybody concurs the design that we've proposed maintains the historical integrity of the dam. We're leaving the existing dam in place. We're not taking it out. We're strengthening it so it stays. Um, the top of the dam, where the little bridge spans across, we had proposed a modification. She's really going to be focusing, I believe, on that and, and saying, does that rise to a certain threshold to whether it would trigger that? We have said, if it does, let us know, and perhaps we might be able to, to mitigate that design so we can avoid the adverse impact conclusion. So I'm optimistic that they're going to conclude there's no adverse impact is their conclusion. SHPO will agree with that, and then that will complete the Army Corps process. But we won't know until uh, Ms. Quinn has a report done, which is, I mean, they got, there's two feet of snow out there. I was humping through it earlier, got the day up just now. But um, we hope to have a, at least a preliminary one a month, perhaps, something like that. Well, it's so what she had told me is it probably wouldn't be the actual drill till at the end of April. And then they need to have time. Right. Yeah. I but mean, realistically. I was surprised that they said, can we come out Friday and do a site visit? And I was going to check tomorrow mm -hmm. to see what the can next I steep go down and dig a hole down there. But the Army Corps of Engineers, you're saying we've got the permit from the Army Corps of Engineers except for this one piece? Um, no, the Army Corps is, issues these permits for the nation at large. If it's not an individual permit, a general permit, okay. GP1, a general permit two. For in this case, the owner of the the, the, the the dam to be eligible for that permit, you have to satisfy these different criteria. So, um, if we satisfy, really, the only one here is whether there's a historical or archaeology adverse impact. If, if it's concluded no, there's not, then the permit is, is issued. Okay, so that so, one so it's be really the Army Corps. This is not a project that needs, in and of itself, an individual That's Army right. Corps exactly. permit. It just doesn't. Uh -huh. But there is this historic requirement, and luckily for us, from the beginning, we have been favoring the design that leaves the dam, the historic dam there. Jordan, how are you doing? You done for now? Um, no. Um, there's, a, I think, a, a, a list of things that are discussed that I think would be better to do. Oh, I meant on this stuff. issue. Oh, on this one, yeah. I, I just, I, I, sorry. Okay. Okay. Great. I wasn't wrapping up the discussion. <laughs> do you want to wait until executive session or leave till later the legal documents that you need? No, I was going to bring that one up next if you're ready. I imagine you know as much as I do if you've had those conversations, but as far as I can tell, I can only think, well, for now, we need draft, we need, um, I think Joe prefers not quick claim deeds, but to use irrevocable offers of dedication, which I think he could draft in a, an hour uh, or even 10 minutes. Well, there's um, also the access ones. And and, and I those, think those are, the, the yeah. lay down is the contractor, or you deals with the lay down, he's just right. So <laughs> then, and there is an easement probably of access since Camp Road is private. You'd probably need an easement from the Father Gills for repairing the dam. And you probably need escrows. I don't know what happens with those irrevocable. I mean the physical irrevocable offers of de dedication. Whether they're just given to the, I think they just be given to, to your attorney, and they would just sit with the attorney and be reported when the town is ready to report them. Um, then there's the, but that's the only ones I know of, you know, in terms of the current 
property owners. Um, so I do want to just mention that I've had this last week I had had direct communication with the Heises, the Fothergills, and the Miller group, and they are it, still in support of the project. Um, they want it to happen. Um, the Fothergills did acknowledge that they own the camp road, so that's there's no issues there. Um, the, they have, the, the Heises have expressed concern about if there's a permanent, what do you, they are concerned about public access to be the dam after it's fixed. Like, they don't want to see, they don't want to have people swimming from the, on the dam and boating because and from the dam so I think that's something we have to kind of be aware of um, is that if we have if the town has access that it be kind of limited to emergencies and maintenance so this you guys have to decide that but it it's a consideration because um, I think for safety reasons anyways you wouldn't want anybody swimming from there or boating from there we have a boat access we have a swimming so, so, so that was some of the concerns that they had. I just wanted to talk about a process for getting these done. Jordan, I assume you're not clear. You can't call Joe tomorrow and say these are the things we need yet. Is that correct? We, no, we need. That's what I talked to him about today. Oh, so <laughs> so are you confident you've got um, all the all the ones we need and all the information you not, need? Not not entirely, but I think that that ooh, we've been kind of going through this list and, and part of quite literally today's conversation was what makes sense for having a more direct conversation with all the parties involved so that those things can start to be drafted. I mean, I think that it's, a, frankly, I think it's a little bit of a shame that that, that portion of it hasn't, hasn't moved faster because those are the most important parts of a lot of this. And so we're trying to play a little bit of catch up. Um, uh, uh, and there's there are elements of that conversation that I think would be best to kind of discuss as a as a group um, in an executive session okay. um, because it'll also involve uh, negotiations with our outside parties. Um, okay. We also then of course you have the classic construction documents, which would be the RFP, the contract. And those, those, there's not quite the pressure. I mean, I think the pressure is on, it's getting the RFP out. And the pressure is pushing the permit tours as much hard as we can. And the pressure, and you know, those, and, and getting, uh, getting the bond documents and process moving so that we don't miss that deadline. Yeah, and, and, there's, and there's also a concern about um, the authority basically to do that without figuring out the the other elements, or at least having the um, the other elements sorted out uh, in in advance, whether they're held in escrow, et cetera, et cetera. But that that's that's really kind of the gaming out that uh, that we were discussing today, okay. um, and and making sure that that. That we're in like the best legal standing to to actually have an authority, you know, and and then who is the final deciding um, body between? Oh, if this needs to happen one way versus another way, you know, who 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 gets to, to make that decision? Um, we can, I guess, you'll just want to discuss that in executive session or open. Or you're not sure. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure that we'd be quite there yet, but I think that there are still things that. The, the board and uh, the CPA would like the sh should discuss in, the, in that executive okay. session um, if that makes sense. Got it. Okay. But I do think you know, things like I, I think the irrevocable offers and, and maybe escrow instructions if there's an escrow and that's pretty straightforward stuff. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
are we ready to go into executive session or are there other things you want to talk about out here? You've kind of gone through my list. Marge, you talked about going through the timeline. Well, I think, I know, I was using it that we needed a mechanism to get talking, but we did, I don't think we talked about You think we've covered, we've covered it? Yeah. What do you guys think? All right, if I'm understanding correctly, we're going to go into executive session to discuss the legal documents that need to be drawn up, plus, well, the RFP, I guess, is a legal document, and the RFP. Is there anything else? That we're, we're not going to really discuss the contract tonight, are we? Uh, which? The construction contract? Yeah. That's really part of the RFP. That's after the RFP. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, later. Yeah. Are there items in the bid document that does discuss the contract? Um, oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. I think what we're saying is the, uh, I think in the bid documents it says in there, this is what we think a contract is going to be like. Okay. In that case, it sounds to me like we are ready to go into executive session. So, um, Shall we make a, uh, let's make a motion. Um, uh, well, just, I, we're going to make a finding, and I've written it down, and Rose, it's handwritten, but I can give it to you. I would like to make a motion that the select board finds that public viewing of a draft of an RFP, and I'll add, or legal doc, other legal documents, um, that an RFP forbids for construction of the Curtis Pond Dam or other legal documents would place some potential bidders at a disadvantage and that the document should only be made available to the public until it is final and ready to be released to potential bidders or shown to um, the people who might sign the document. And therefore, we should go into executive session under 1 VSA 313.6. I'll get this to you, Rose. Okay, thanks. Did that make sense? Do I need to say it again? No, it's I think we got it. Okay. Uh, I made a motion. So, uh, second. Any further discussion on that? Okay. All in favor? Jamie, yes. You want to say something? Um, I just wonder if. I don't know what time it is. Um, That'll be the second part. But we... if, if that's the majority of the meeting, if we. Um, I want think to take a break. Oh yes, I was going. Session. I was going to okay. suggest that because then um, our orca guy can just pack up right. and go home. Yeah. And yes. Are you inviting anyone else? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't say that. We would like to invite the members of the CPA and uh, their engineer into executive session with us. I pardon me. That was part of the motion. Is that okay with you guys? Yeah. Okay. And I'm sorry. The others of you are here. It's an early, early I, I assume you don't want to wait till we come out. We're unlikely to have anything to report. So, Did you vote on that motion? No, we didn't. I was, we're still in discussion. Yeah. Is this? Do you want me to leave the recorder on sitting there? Oh, geez. No. The thing is, Gabrielle will want to hear it. Can we record it, an executive session just for her? We can't even do oh, that. Just for Gabrielle? Yeah. Just for Gabrielle. You can, sure. So, all right. Well, we've admitted to it, it can be discovered, so. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Okay. No, I don't know. All right, um, yeah. the motion has been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So we're gonna take a, a short break while uh, we pack up and then we'll reconvene. And we still have to make the app.